I'll introduce our new uh, next staff uh, speaker, Justin D'Ambrosio, our very own from St. Andrews. So to the people in the room, I don't know if I need to really introduce Justin, but for those who don't know Justin and who, uh, well, were, you know, um, unfortunate to not know <laughs> Justin, um, Justin's mostly a philosopher of mind and language with some forays into different value theory topics. Language is applied to political speech. And in this case, uh, the paradox of fiction, which is why he's here at the Scottish Aesthetics Forum. Um, and I'm sure he'll um, tell us to teach us about language and mind um, to us, you know, lowly aestheticians. Um, so. <laughs> not, not remotely, not remotely. No, I, you will teach me about aesthetics, right. and I will uh, hopefully maybe say something interesting in the talk discussion. Sorry, I feel like whenever people are, you know, they're, they're displayed happy. behind me, I'm like waving to the camera, but I really, I feel like I should turn around. And, anyway, it's very confusing. Anyway. Should I unspotlight you, or is that? Oh, I don't know, it's fine. I don't, I don't mind. I think that infinite tower of, <laughs> yeah. the infinite just, tower of Justin's is correct. Yeah, that's great. But as a tour of It's also a mirroring. <laughs> there are like many, there are like many me. Okay, it's very strange. Okay, it is, right? We'll go back to non spot for QA and we'll see everyone. Okay, but fine, fine. Please um, go ahead. Sure. Um, Thanks. Thank you for coming, uh, everyone, for coming. That's um, so. Okay, so I want to start. Um, I start a little background, uh, Daniel Stoljar. And I, so this is joint work with Daniel Stoljar. We've had quite a big project on imagination. This is a sort of one paper in a series working on um, primarily uh, imagining what things are like and it, basically trying to, uh, we're working on perspective in imagination and uh, imagining what things are like and we'll see how those two things are connected. So one, goal of the project is to give an account of perspective generally, but particularly perspective in imagination, which has some distinctive features. And we were trying to also solve the sort of traditional puzzle about inside and outside imagining when we when we got the project going. But then we realized that this had a kind of nice, straightforward application to the paradox of fiction. And so I kind of wrote this up and hopefully it will be um, somewhat uh, enlightening or informative or at least give a new a new approach. So, uh, so I want to start with two truisms. Um, so the first truism is just that fiction prompts or engages the imagination. Um, so exactly what this relationship is, is a matter of some dispute, but we're going to try to uh, spell this out in a very specific way in the talk. Um, you know, spelling out how it is that authors ask people who engage with fictions to imagine. Um, okay, and of course, this prompting, the way that authors of fiction prompt us to, you know, to imagine is somehow responsible for our affective responses to fiction. So clearly, fiction brings about strong emotional and affective responses, um, like it, it's the most natural thing in the world to think, you know, to, to feel sort of, um, you know, sad. So um, the running example I'm going to use is from Le Carre. Uh, so Jim Prido is this uh, character in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and I'm sorry to spoil the novel for you, but he uh, is betrayed, and you don't know who uh, betrays him until the end of the novel, but uh, it, he, you sort of see how he's betrayed initially and then who betrays him at the end, and it's like quite a poignant, um, poignant sort of uh turn because it turns out that it's his lover who has betrayed him or his one-time lover who has betrayed him um and also like this nat who's also this kind of national hero anyway um so so the question here is like how does fiction prompt us to imagine so standardly i think amy kind has this view that fiction is seen as telling us or instructing us or asking us to imagine that various things are the case with very so with various fictional characters in a certain uh, fictional world, right? So we think we can describe a fictional world by imagining a bunch of propositions that are true or hold in that world. And then we can examine, you know, various things, various events that occur, various people um, do certain things, can describe what they're like. Um, 
But the problem is that this simple model of how sorry, fiction prompts the imagination leaves us with without an understanding of why fiction causes us to have these strong emotional responses. Um, the reason is that why should we care about what goes on in a possible world, a merely possible world that, that we know is not actual? Why should we care about fictional characters that are not real and fictional events that do not occur? Right? It seems that if anything, uh, you know, when we, we find out or we realize that we're just talking about a fiction, we're not going to have you know, genuine emotional responses. We should be relieved that, you know, say something bad happens to Prito, you know, it's like, well, thankfully that's not real, right? We can feel kind of relieved. We'll, we'll talk about that um, a bit more as, as the talk goes on. So sometimes the question of why are our emotional, what, why do we have emotional responses or why are our emotional responses justified is called the paradox of fiction. And we'll spell out what that paradox is in a minute. So the point of the paper is that the standard view of how fiction interacts with the imagination is significantly impoverished um, by developing a richer account of how fiction prompts the imagination. We're going to be able to give an explanation of why our affective responses to uh, to fiction are perfectly rational. Okay, so the paradox of fiction, as I said, is just uh, given that our world is not as a fiction describes describes, and we know this. Why do we react emotionally to fiction, right? Why is it rational, or just we want it? We want an explanation. Um, so more often, it's put as an inconsistent triad: uh, the paradox of fiction. So. On the one hand, we have emotions concerning the situations construed broadly as events, situations, uh, eventualities in which uh, of fictional characters are, or that, that fictional characters are described as being in. To have an emotion concerned, so that's PF1. PF2, to have an emotion concerning someone's situation, we must believe that the propositions that describe, oh, sorry, we must believe the propositions that describe or characterize that situation. And PF3, we don't believe the propositions that describe the situations of fictional characters. So, uh, of course, this is from Greg Curry. I don't, um, uh, so there are a few questions that we want to use to sharpen up the, or we, that we can, we can ask to sharpen up the paradox. First, um, PF2, uh, to have an emotion concerning someone's situation, we must, believe the propositions that describe the situation. What, what do you mean by, what do we mean by must? Like, it, is it, so actually different people have different views. Some people think that we actually cannot metaphysically have an emotion uh, if we don't believe the propositions describing the character situation. Um, other people, I think Radford's original formulation of the, of the paradox was that we can't rationally uh, respond we, we can't have rational emotional responses without believing those propositions. Um, so there's some debate about this. We'll actually see in our solution, uh, we'll clarify that like there are different ways of, of disambiguating the must or specifying the must, the modality there, and they'll lead to slightly different responses. Um, okay, so, so the second question, I guess, is like, why should, what motivation do we have for believing these claims? Like why some of these, so PF2 in particular looks kind of questionable, like we might not have motivation to believe it in the first place. Okay, um, well, the first thing is that emotions seem to have aptness or correctness conditions. They seem to be correct only in certain circumstances. Um, and it seems that if the circumstances that uh, you know, in which they're apt or correct are not realized, then they're going to be inapt, or there's something inapt about them. Um, so there are also a number of other another considerations in favor of PF2. One consideration is that there's clearly something different about having emotion toward things that exist and things that do not, right? So when we learn, so for instance, when we, Radford has what he calls rug pull cases, when you, uh, you start out believing that something is real and you have this strong emotional response, you find out that it's not real, those emotional responses are either attenuated or lost completely or turn into something very different, like relief, like I was saying before. Um, and there's also this consideration uh, that emotions generated by fiction aren't sort of rationally action guiding in the same, they don't guide rational action in the same way 
that emotions toward real situations might, or they don't spur a prompt action in that way. Um, so the consequence of this um, paradox is supposed to be that our, our responses to fiction are just never, never. So if we construe must in a particular way, if we construe it as the must of rationality, as opposed to the must of, um, sorry, the must of metaphysical necessity, uh, then we end up with the, res the result that our emotional responses to fiction are never rational. If we construe it in a stronger way, we end up with the conclusion that we simply can't have, uh, we cannot have emotional responses to fiction. Um, if we don't believe the relevant proposition. Um, okay, so I don't want to put actually, I don't want to get too much into the details of how the uh, the paradox should be formulated. Like, I really think that the key sort of the, the sort of important part of our proposal is that we're providing a, a mechanism or, or sort of a, an explanation of like why we respond to fictions in the way that we do. Now, that will, it will turn out that there are different ways of resolving the puzzle given the, the sort of proposal we make. And we'll go through some of those later, but I don't, I don't get distracted if you don't find PF2 very plausible. Don't get distracted if you, you know, you think there's like an obvious solution or something. Like what we want to do is, is like, you know, reveal the mechanism underlying emotional responses to fiction. And then we can come back to the paradox and say why it did or did not make sense in the first place. So this is just a kind of scaffold to get us, um, get us moving. Um, okay, so now we're going to describe a view that has five parts. Um, it, it's not as complicated, like actually some of the parts are kind of trivial, but um, uh, it's going to describe how uh, fiction interacts with the imagination. And once we describe how fiction interacts with the imagination, you're going to see why uh, emotional response, you know, see why emotional responses are perfectly possible, but not only possible, perfectly rational. Um, so the first component is a, a broader notion of imagination generally, of what kinds of things we can imagine. We might think of it as being a tripartite division between types of imaginings. Um, so this has its basis in some in just basic semantic ideas that the verb imagine takes different kinds of compliments. Compliments like uh, it can take uh, phrasal compliments. So, like, uh, so start with forget forget the semantic stuff. We'll go back to that. So we can imagine objects and events and situations, um, and these are sometimes captured or expressed by uh, reports of imagining that have a phrasal compliment, like a denotational phrase, like a name. Or, you know, uh, I can imagine, you know, some event referred to by like, I imagined Jim's betrayal, right? Or uh, I might imagine, um, you know, running outside. So these denote particular objects and events, and we can call this form of imagining objectual imagining. Um, so example one, I'm imagining Jim Prudo, um, but I might also imagine his betrayal and capture. Okay, so there's a kind of correspondence here between the different kinds of compliments that these verbs take and the different forms or modes of imagining that we can undertake. Um, so yeah, basically this know. first category yeah, is anything, any, any kind of imagination, notational phrase compliment. Your style so very happy. Just be objects and events, ordinary physical objects and events. Um, and of course, in many cases, we're going to be asked to imagine objects that don't exist and events that do not occur. But that doesn't matter all that much because imagines is not, or sorry, imagine is not existence entailing in its object position. So it's what's called an intentional transitive verb, although it's a very strange one. But the idea is that it doesn't, we don't require exist the existence of Jim Prido in order to imagine him. We don't need to, his, his betrayal didn't need to occur in order to imagine him. Okay, so the second form is somewhat more familiar and I think it's the model that most uh, people thinking about imagination have in mind. So it's the standard propositional model of imagination, imagining that certain things are the case. So um, propositional imagining uh, is reported by sentences like Justin is imagining that Jim was captured. Justin is imagining that the world has ended. Justin is imagining various other kinds of propositions which describe these fictional 
you know, nearly possible worlds that are not actual. Um, so imagination, there's this kind of standard view of imagination, which is that imagination is a representational mental state that represents possible but not actual states. And typically built into that conception is that uh, the content of the representational mental state is propositional. So that's the kind of what, what you'll find everywhere and lots of debates uh, and criticisms of you know, various proposals about imagining turn on the idea that imagination is kind of uh, fundamentally or maybe exclusively propositional. And uh, as we saw, actually, that can't be right if there's such a thing as objectual imagining. Um, the situation is complicated. We'll, we'll talk about it there. Um, OK, so the third kind of imagining or category of imagining is what we call imagining WH. So everyone knows that you can make a distinction between knowing how and knowing that, right? Or knowing WH, knowing who, what, where, when, why, and knowing that. So similar distinction can be made for imagination. So um, we can, in fact, imagination can accept just as, you know, it can accept lots of that complement but it can accept a wide range of WH complements as well. Um, so Alex, imagine what being captured by the Czech army is like, which is what happened to Prido. That's why I'm using the example, um, uh, Alex. And so we have these, these locutions. So in 5A through C, I basically take all of those to be equivalent. Um, so Alex imagined what being captured by the Czech army is like. Alex imagined what it's like to be captured by the Czech army. Alex imagined how it feels to be captured by the Czech army. Um, we'll talk about the addition of feels in a second. That's, that's actually component four. Um, but you can also have things like Franz is imagining what Jim looks like running through the woods. Uh, Daniel imagined how the Czech army managed to capture Jim. Uh, Louise imagine why Hayden would betray England. These are all grammatical. Um, they're semantic. It's, it's an open question exactly what their semantics is. Uh, that's not something we're going to talk about today. I've got a separate project on that. But um, the, the point is that these all, it's a kind of form of imagining or a form of words that seems to report something kind of distinctive or that goes beyond normal propositional imagining. Um, okay, so there are lots of semantic issues here. Are these complements actual interrogatives or are they so-called free relatives? Um, that's a distinction in, in how we treat uh, the semantics of WH complements. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of this talk. Um, and you know, if they are interrogatives, what should their semantics be? Um, also a question that we can talk about later that, that you know, may be in the Q&A that won't matter that much for this talk. Um, okay, so we have this tripartite distinction within imagination, objectual imagining, propositional imagining, and imagining WH. Okay, now we can turn to how fiction prompts us to imagine in various ways. So authors of fiction ask or instruct us, those of us who engage with fiction, to imagine certain kinds of things, right? So novels, like, you know, they're kind of sets that we might think of novels or films or any kinds of fiction as sort of sets of imaginative instructions. This is just a kind of general, quite plausible view uh, that I think is relatively widely accepted that we're taking on board. Um, so of course, fiction can prompt us or you know, authors of fiction can instruct us to imagine in any of these three ways that we've just described, right? Not just propositionally. Uh, so some things we're asked to imagine may be propositional, um, but we may be able to, you know, so on the one hand, we might have, we might be instructed to imagine that Jim was captured, but at the same time, there's another mental state that we're asked to go into, which is imagining Jim and imagining the event of his capture, right? So there are many, it's not just that we're asked to imagine one thing, there's going to be this whole cluster of imaginative states that we go into whenever we're prompted to, to imagine anything by fiction. Okay. Um, so we might think of, I mean, one way you can think of it is sort of fit works of fiction as implicitly prefaced with an imperative or something, or, or as, as you know, the author of fiction is requesting something of us. Uh, I don't want to hang too much on this, but that, that might be one way, like imagine this, Jim goes here, you know, he, he's captured by the, you know, by the Czech army 
you know, he's shot in the back, his, you know, his shoulder hikes up to his ear and he's, you know, permanently disabled, still really physically, anyway, so see how that works. So interestingly, we're not usually um, explicitly asked to imagine what things are like or where things are or whatever, right? Typically this just operates by means of describing a fictional world, right? So the question, if we are prompted or asked or requested to imagine WH, it's somehow implicit in what's going on, in what we're already being asked to imagine, which are simply the objects and events of the fiction, right? Or various propositions, right? The, the propositions corresponding to maybe the full declarative sentences of the fiction or whatever. Obviously, this is a simplistic model. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a, a perfectly general or, or you know, fully worked out model, but okay. <clears throat> so component three of the view is the crucial component. So we think that there's an equivalence. Uh, it's called, we call it NP or it could be DP, uh, WIL, which is what it's like. So necessarily, should I change? This is, this is one of the inconsistencies, sorry. Um, NP and DP are, they should just be one or the other all the way through. Whether it's an NP or whether it's a DP depends on your views on a certain question in syntax that most people in aesthetics probably don't care about. It depends on whether or not you like the results of Stephen Abney's dissertation from 1987. Anyway, um, okay. But the point is that it's a, it's a phrase and it's, a, it's like a denotational or a nominal phrase, right? Um, so, or a, so it's either a deter, DP is a determiner phrase, NP is a noun phrase, doesn't matter, but it's some kind of uh, referring type expression. So we think that necessarily to imagine DP is to imagine what DP is like. So um, to imagine Prido is to imagine what Prido is like. To imagine Jim Prido's capture is to imagine what Jim Prido's capture is like. So long as Jim Prido's capture is a denotational phrase for an event. Uh, to, imagine, um, to imagine the water is to imagine what the water is like. To imagine, so we think that this is like an extremely productive schema. Like it's a, it's a, in fact, so we think we've stated it metaphysically here. Necessarily to imagine, objectively is to imagine. So basically, we're equating a certain kind of, we're equating objectual imagining with a certain kind of imagining WH. Right. So there's a sub. So all objectual imaginings are equivalent to certain instances of imagining WH. Um, so this is a metaphysical claim. It's a claim about the nature of imagining or maybe the content of imagining, but we can also, it, it has some support from uh, a semantic claim, which is the claim that, uh, that reports of imagining that have DP complements, like denotational phrase complements, they conceal questions. So what is it to conceal a question? Okay, consider 11, 12, and 13. John knows Mary's phone number. That's among, in, in the literature, there's a whole literature on concealed questions. Uh, that's equivalent to John knows what Mary's phone number is. So you have these, these phrasal complements that turn out to actually be in the semantics, hidden questions. Uh, same thing for 12, John remembered the capital of Wyoming is equivalent to John remembered what the capital of Wyoming is. John told Mary the top of the top song in the hottest 100. John told Mary what the top song in the hottest 100 is. I think maybe Greg is the only one who's going to get that reference. No? Yeah, oh, you get it. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't actually know what it was. <laughs> um, okay, so we think that, um, so compare examples, those examples to examples of imagining. There's, there's something slightly different here, but uh, they're, they're relevantly similar, we think. So Justin imagined Hayden's betrayal. Justin imagined what Hayden's betrayal was like. Um, Frank imagined being betrayed. Frank imagined what being betrayed is like. Uh, Christina imagined Smiley. Christina imagined what Smiley is like. Of course, in the first case, we have uh, we have what are called specification for there. So the DP conceals a certain kind of complement of what it is complement, which is like a, an identity question or a specification question. 
Here it con conceals a different kind of WH question, a what it's like question. So that's the difference between the verbs that are typically maintained to conceal questions and imagine. But there's good evidence that if you think that 11 through 13 are instances of concealed questions, you should also think that 14 through 16 are. Um, what that evidence is, is uh, a collection of inference, pat inference patterns and patterning behavior that we don't have to go through right now. Um, so we're just going to state this as a metaphysical thesis because that's uh, what's relevant, I think, for the, the point of, in the philosophy of mind and aesthetics. Okay, but we don't just imagine what things are like. So this is component four. We, there are many modalities in which we can imagine things. So you might imagine what something smells like, what something tastes like, what it feels like, what it looks like, all of these different uh, modalities. Um, so you might think of, this is a kind of determinable to determinate relationship um, that imagining what something is like, you can do that in any number of different ways, each of which is a sort of is a, a determinant of the sort of general category of imagining what something is like. Um, so, but we do think that there are kind of, uh, you might call them default connections between imagining certain kinds of things and imagining them in certain modalities. So uh, we think that to imagine what an event is like standardly or typically, but not always, is to imagine what it feels like. So to imagine that in a certain kind of modality. Of course, you can imagine what events look like, but it's a little bit, it's like not as natural, right? So you often imagine what the event feels like to the agent who undertakes it or to the agent of the event. But we think that conversely, to imagine what an object, like an ordinary object, you know, like this camera or Colin, or uh, to imagine what those things are like it is typically or standardly, but not always to imagine what that thing looks like. So imagining ordinary objects is highly, we, we tend to think of it very visually, right? I mean, we tend to, to comply with these instructions when we're, when we're asked or prompted to imagine a physical object, we tend to imagine, we tend to comply visually. Of course, we can, we can comply in many other ways. This is a kind of maybe psychological claim but as far as the language is concerned, it's a pragmatic claim. It's a pragmatic claim that when we are asked to imagine certain categories of objects, there's a, a, a default mode of complying, perhaps just with psychological you know, underpinnings, that we tend to, uh, we, we get kind of default inferences to, you know, uh, we understand, imagine what this is like, to imagine what this feels like, or imagine what this looks like, depending on what it is that we're imagining. So this is a kind of pragma a pragmatic claim in linguistics and a psychological claim about the nature of imagining, sort of made in 3.4. Um, so I think it's, this is something that's probably ripe for empirical uh, investigation. Interestingly, Nagel in What's It Like to Be a Bat talks about two different modes of imagining what he calls sympathetic and, um, oh, sorry, he calls it is it visual and sympathetic? Anyway, he distinguishes between two different kinds of imaginings. And he thinks that we imagine physical objects like you know, ourselves on the visual model. And then when we're asked to talk, think about experiences or consciousness, we're trying to imagine them in a totally different modality. And he actually proposes that as like a potential solution to the mind-body problem. Um, but the point is that there are these different modes of imagining and they've like found their way into different discussions in the philosophy of mind. They play a relatively important role, I think, in the philosophy of mind. Okay, so that's component four. So now what we have is that ordinary requests to imagine things in certain ways turn out to be imagine, you know, requests to imagine what things are like or, you know, in certain modalities. So what things feel like, what certain things feel like, what they look like, whatever, depending on what we're asked to imagine. There's no necessity of imagining it in a certain modality. It's just we tend to comply in that way. Okay, last component is the perspectival component. So um, imagining what things are like is always perspectival. You can't imagine non-perspectively uh, insofar as there's a, it's a sort of phenomenal state. Uh, there's always some kind of perspectival element to it. 
um, we always imagine what things look, feel, sound, smell like um, to someone. So we call this person, we actually think that this is a, a, a suppressed argument in the compliments, in what it's like compliments. So you can always make this argument explicit with this adjunct phrase, like to some, or you know, whether it's an adjunct phrase is an open question, but you can always bring it out with a prepositional phrase to someone. Um, <clears throat> we're not the first to talk about this. So Daniel and I have talked about this. Daniel talked about it himself before, but this is like pretty in the event semantics literature, pretty well attested that there are experience or arguments um, in, uh, for instance, perceptual reports and various kinds of uh, reports about the nature of experience. So Giz Nicholas Gisborne talks about this. Um, so when the author of a fiction instructs us to imagine something from a particular perspective, um, they're instructing us to imagine what something is like to an experiencer of a particular kind with particular properties, for instance. So um, you might, so to keep with the example, uh, Le Carre might ask us to imagine what Prito's betrayal is like to someone who loves anger, right? So he might characterize or specify certain properties that the experiencer has to have, right? So you're, you're specifying the nature of the perspective uh, from which you are asking someone to imagine a certain kind of event or a certain kind of object. You know, what Prito looks like to somebody with, you know, good style or to a little child, right? With who has bad eyesight, I don't know. Um, okay, so now we have a kind of general schema in 17 uh, for going from ordinary uh, you know, reports of imagination or you know, requests to imagine to uh, something that has a lot more structure than we thought it might've had at first. So we start out with just, you, know, you can either say just an imagine Hayden's betrayal, or you might think of it as an author saying, imagine Hayden's betrayal. Right? We think these equivalences work either in the imperative mood or the declarative. So Justin, imagine Hayden's betrayal by component three. That's equivalent to Justin, imagine what Hayden's betrayal was like. By component four, um, sorry, yeah, uh, by component four, that's not equivalent to, but it is typically or standardly complied with by imagining what Hayden's betrayal felt like or feels like. So that's just a pragmatic psychological claim. Um, and then by component five, that is in turn equivalent to Justin imagine what Hayden's betrayal felt like to some person, for example, Jim in this case. So we have we have some we started out with a simple request to imagine an event, which might be prompted by a description of the event in, in a novel. And we ended up with something much richer. We ended up with what Hayden's betrayal felt like to a particular person. So there's a component of feeling in the request and there's an experiencer in the request. Those were not present before. So now what we've, we've shown is that even though we're not explicitly asked to imagine WH at all uh, in the novel, you know, in the novel or in the piece of fiction itself, we, we've seen via this equivalence that we are asked to imagine what certain things feel like to certain people. So that's now what, what you might say is sort of part of the content of the request or part of the content of what we're being asked to imagine. Okay, one more final little semantic point is that uh, there need not be any particular person from whose perspective we're asked to imagine. So we think that the, the um, experience or argument place is what we might call notional. It can be occupied by non-specific non uh, noun phrases. So I might ask uh, someone to imagine this situation from the perspective of, you know, a Russian, or, you know, I might, we might, you know, imagine the war from the perspective of a Russian, or imagine the war from the perspective of a Ukrainian, but not any particular one, right? So we're, we can, we can talk perspectives on our view, correspond to different arguments to the experience or argument place. And those can be non-specific, but they, we can talk about the various properties that any experiencer needs to have or that the experiencer needs to have. Okay. I don't actually know. Oh yeah, okay, that's fine.
Okay, so now we've got all of the machinery in place. And I recognize that we're, so there's a little bit of infelicity in the handout, partly because I initially gave this talk to a bunch of semanticists and they were like, what are you, what, you know, what are you talking about? And they were like, all they wanted to talk about was like concealed questions the whole time. And I was like, that's fine. I'm, I'm interested in that. We can talk about that. But that was, they were like, are you interested in the other parts of the talk? Anyway, I, it didn't seem like it. But um, so there, there's a little, there was a lot of semantic, I, I like put a little more semantic stuff in the handout than I would ordinarily for aesthetics talk, but it's giving you a sense of the sort of direction I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, how does this solve the problem? So fiction asks us to ask or instruct uh, instructs us to imagine various things, um, among which are various kind of uh, events and states. So, you know, Jim's capture, Hayden's betrayal, Smiley's search, whatever. That's from components one and two. Those are the kind of background views, the nature of imagination, uh, the, the tripartite kind, you know, division in imagination, and the idea that fiction is a kind of request for us or a set of instructions for us to imagine. Um, now, to imagine an event is, at least standardly, to imagine what that event feels like to somebody. Um, that, so it's, we're going to, by stipulation, we're going to call that having a vicarious experience. That's a term from uh, Wendler, famous discussion of Wendler's, but that's actually what we, we think this is a different analysis that he offers, but to imagine what something, what an event feels like to someone, we think that's to have a vicarious experience. Um, so we think that experiences have to do with what things feel like to people. And that's why we call them, so that's why we call them vicarious experiences. Okay, so given this basic setup, this gives us actually two very closely related, actually maybe identical, you can tell me, ways of solving the problem. Sol solving the paradox of fiction or resolving or dissolving the paradox of fiction. Um, Okay, so when we comply with the instructions laid out by the fiction, we imagine what an event feels like to somebody. That's the result of components one through five. In doing so, we go into a state that is phenomenally similar to, and in principle, phenomenally identical to, the experience that that person has in being made to feel a certain way by that event. So if I'm imagining what uh, Hayden's betrayal feels like to Smiley, in exactly the same way that when I imagine, you know, a chair, I go into a state that's phenomenally similar to my seeing a chair. When I imagine what it's like to Smiley, I go into a state that's phenomenally similar to how he feels when he's made to felt a certain way by Jim's betrayal. So there's a phenomenal similarity claim, just like imaginings in general are phenomenally similar to their perceptual counterparts. Or sorry, imag imagining like ordinary imaginings uh, are phenomenally similar to their perceptual counterparts. Um, imagining experiences are phenomenally similar to their sort of experiential counterparts. Um, so if, if Smiley is made to feel horrible, my imagining will be relevantly, or will be similar, maybe in principle, like phenomenally identical to, it will feel the same way as how he feels when he goes into that state. So that's a kind of important, important point. Um, Okay, so insofar as the event makes the experiencer sad, angry, dismayed, we will go into a state that's phenomenally similar or perhaps identical to these emotional states. So they respond effectively, and we go into a state that is phenomenally similar and in principle identical to their affective states. Okay. Um, now, how does that solve the problem? Well, uh, The, the sort of simplest way of thinking about it is that is, so we are requested by the author to go into a state that is phenomenally similar to the state that the experiencer goes into when they are affected by that event. So it's, in effect, we are being asked to go into a certain phenomenal state. We are asked to imagine what it feels like to someone. So that's what it, so insofar as we comply with the instructions or do what the author of the fiction has asked us to do, 
we go into that emotional, we go into a state that is phenomenal, in principle, phenomenally indistinguishable from the affective or emotional state that the character in the fiction or the experiencer goes into. Okay. Um, so one way of thinking is why, okay, solution one, why is it rational to respond effectively to, uh, to fictions? Well, because we are, that's what it is to fully engage with the fiction by complying with the instructions that we've been offered. That's, that's solution one or explanation one. Explanation two um, is I think almost identical. It might actually just be a, a, a I thought that they were distinct, but I might have been wrong. So you can tell me what you think. So given component four above, authors ask us to imagine what things are like from various perspectives. So the author may well ask us to imagine what a particular event feels like to someone who wants it not to happen, for instance, right? I might imagine there's this old kind of uh, puzzle about desires in fiction, right? Like why would, you know, why do we want certain, do we want third things to be, you know, different in the fiction? No, we're, we're so the way of, so if we if we put the the thing about the issue about desire into the perspectival component, we're imagining these events from the perspective of somebody who wants them not to happen. Now it's perfectly understandable why someone who wants them not to happen would feel a certain way when they do, right? So it's perfectly rational that that person would the the perspect the person from whose perspective we're asked to imagine would feel that way, right? So then it's part of the instructions that the author has sort of offered us that we, we imagine from the perspective of someone who wants this not to happen or who is happy at it happening or whatever, right? And thereby have the same kind of, go into the same kind of uh, affective state that they would have given this event takes place and affects them in a certain way. Um, so the idea is that you could, you can bring out the, the affective component by putting the sort of desires or putting certain kinds of beliefs or desires in the perspectival part of the um, imagining part of you know, that part of the content. And then it will make sense of why we respond emotionally in the way that we do, because the, the experiencer has those features, has those beliefs, desires, and we're, we're um, mimicking or uh, vicariously experiencing what the experiencer is experiencing, right? We're going into a, an affective state that is phenomenally similar or perhaps phenomenally identical to what they are uh, going into. Okay, so that's basically the view um, that once we look at a, a richer range of imaginings and we see that the content, that the things that we can be asked or prompted to imagine are actually much richer than just imagining that something is the case, uh, we end up with a situation where we're asked to imagine what things feel like and so that is what, it's not just that we're imagining bare objects, ob, you know, why should we be made to, you know, why should imagining these objects make us feel any, you know, one way or the other. It's like the author is asking us to look at things from people's perspectives or feel how they feel. Um, so now the question is, which premise do we deny? Um, that turns out to be a difficult question because it depends on a lot of background facts that we are not going to take a stand on. Um, so the first question is whether we think vicarious experiences of emotion are genuine experiences of emotion. So I've said that when we have vicarious experiences, we go into a state that is phenomenally similar and in principle phenomenally identical to the affective state of the experiencer. But the question is, is that all there is to, a, to an emotion? Is it only, it, so does phenomenal identity suffice for being a genuine emotion? Um, so basically is vicarious <coughs> sadness, sadness. And there are lots of different ways. So that depends of course on what your views on emotion are. And I don't really have any views on emotion. Um, that's not true. I, I do have some views on emotion. Um, so, but there are two options. For the purposes of this paper, there are two options. One is to say that um, experiences that are uh, phenomenally indistinguishable from sadness are not sadness. Um, 
that that leads to a kind of what, what, I, what I'll call disjunctivism about emotions, right? That there are two categories of, of like basically affective states. There are genuine emotions, and then there are things that are phenomenally indistinguishable from genuine emotions, right? And the phenomenal indistinguishable, the things that are phenomenally indistinguishable from genuine emotions, we can call them quasi-emotions, right? We can call them whatever we want, but they're effectively like, uh, they're, they're analogous to hallucinations, which are in principle phenomenally identical to genuine perceptual experiences, but they're not the, the genuine article. Okay, so if we say like, if we, we have, we wanna say that, you know, we hold Walton's view, for instance, and Walton thinks that you can only have genuine emotions if the, you know, you have the corresponding beliefs, then these things don't qualify as genuine emotions. Fine, doesn't matter. Let's be disjunctivists about, uh, disjunctivists about emotion. And in that case, we deny PF1, right? So what's PF1? Go back to the beginning. Uh, we don't have genuine emotions concerning the situations of fictional characters, right? We have quasi-emotions about them, but it doesn't matter because the quasi-emotions themselves are still rational, right? That was the main point that we were trying to show. That's why like our solution isn't, we're not so concerned with which premise we deny because we might deny PF1, but there's still this residual question about, okay, we, we, have, we go into some kind of affective state, whether or not it's a, a, a genuine instance of sadness or an instance of quasi-sadness, there's still a kind of residual question about why, why it's rational to have that response. So we think that no matter whatever, or however we classify the affective responses, they're still rational in virtue of the story we've told. Okay, other option is to say actually anything phenomenally indistinguishable from an emotion is an emotion. Um, and that turns out to be uh, what we can call a rep form of representationalism or conjunctivism about uh, about emotion. I don't know if people are familiar with the debates in philosophy of perception, but anyway, that's a kind of standard division. It's like, are hallucinations and vertical perceptions the same kind of thing fundamentally, or are they different kinds of things fundamentally? The former category is sort of usually thought of as sufficient condition for being a representationalist or a conjunctivist. The latter is sort of seen as a, a different form of what, what they call disjunctivism. And everyone on this island seems to be in the latter category. Um, unless you've come from elsewhere like that. Uh, anyway, so if we're representationalists, then we can just deny PF2. Um, so to have an emotion concerning some, you know, someone's situation, we, we must believe that the proposition, we must believe the propositions that describe that situation. We can deny that perfectly easily because, so then we're going to have, uh, you know, affective states that are phenomenally indistinguishable from these kind of you know, paradigmatic instances of emotion, and they're going to qualify as genuine emotions, but they're rational too, for the same reasons we've talked about. Because they're just responses, they're, they're uh, phenomenally similar, you know, in, in just the way the author has, phenomenally similar to these kinds of uh, affective states in exactly the way that the author of the fiction has asked us to, to do there, or sorry, that sentence didn't make sense, but you see what I'm trying to say, I hope. Um, okay, so which, which premise of the puzzle or which principle we deny depends on our background theory of emotion. We don't really want to commit to one or the other, but the point is that either way, whatever, however we classify these states uh, as genuine emotions or not, they're going to turn out to be rational, uh, going to turn out to be perfectly, we, have the, we understand the mechanism uh, underlying how they arise. Okay. So maybe like two more minutes just to canvas the other kinds of views. Um, I, so really what we've said is not uh, obviously, it doesn't obviously fall into any camp, sort of which, which camp or which sort of standard form of solution we adopt or we can be seen as adopting depends on the question that we just discussed, which is what's your background theory of emotion and uh, do, so Walton is famous for what's called the pretense response. He says, we're not actually having genuine emotional responses toward fiction. We only have, we're only having sort of uh, quasi emotions, and, you know, quasi sad that Prito got, you know, shot in the back. Uh, I'm, you, you see the point. Um, of course, 
The problem is that that view is not satisfactory because we can raise the same rationality puzzle for quasi functions, right? And our view solves that uh, the puzzle that his view does not, because there's there's still a rationality issue in the in the area whether or not we want to call them take them whether or not we want to call quasi you know whether they're quasi or regular. I'm like on the last two bullet points. <laughs> um, I read the paper, so it's all good. Well, it's probably worse than, well, I'm not sure if it's better or worse than the talk. It's certainly earlier. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, what's called sometimes called the thought response is basically the view that like, well, you know, there was no motivation to PF2 in the first place. Right. Nobody was ever worried about this, the, these reactions not being rational. Um, so there's no, I mean, we just, so emotion is something that's like much broader and it much broader in the first place. And like, of course, one special case of emotion might be when we have emotions toward particular existent things or events that occur. Uh, but there's another case that you can perfectly well be directed toward events or on events that don't occur and objects that don't exist. And there's nothing unintelligible about that. There's no, uh, no reason that would be irrational. Now, there are still some challenges for this view, right? Like, what's the difference between these two kinds of cases? Why do our emotions dissipate when we, you know, what are, so there are certain kinds of counterfactuals that hold, uh, like, if I would have known that this wasn't real, I would have acted differently or whatever. Um, and there, there are various, anyway, there are challenges, but it's perfectly fine. I mean, our view could be, if you say it could be considered a form of this view, because we, we do think that, uh, so if, if, for instance, we just adopt the kind of conjunctivist view, then these are all emotions, right? Uh, and we've given an explanation of why they're rational, right? We've given a, a, an explanation of the mechanism underlying our sort of uh, the generation of the affective response. And that is, I think, something that maybe uh, the thought response also lacks. So we're, I think we've given that, you know, given provided something that both of those views lack. Um, okay. The last response is like the, I think, the silliest one. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time trying to shoot it down. Uh, it's just like actually. We don't believe, uh, so we suspend judgment. So the reason we have emotional responses to these things and they're perfectly rational is that sort of while we're engaging with fiction, uh, we actually think that they're real and that these things are happening and that we can't sort of pull ourselves out of the mindset. We suspend our beliefs about them not being genuine. Um, and so we, so, but then there's some like other, I mean, there's a huge problem with that, which is like, we have other rational norms too, which, you know, you can't just like, oh, I just suspend all of my beliefs the moment I start watching a television show. And then like, I look away and then like things, you know, so all of a sudden you've got this insane, these, these sort of insane rational norms, like things, you know, going in and out of existence, depending on whether I'm engaging with the fiction or whatever that, I mean, not a very plausible view. Um, Langlin Hassan endorses a, a weird form of this view because he thinks that you, you genuinely believe the proposition that it is fictional that this is the case. Uh, so I, anyway, why he describes himself as, as in that camp is a little bit of a mystery to me. But anyway, um, so I, I don't actually think that it's particularly plausible that we're under some sort of illusion and, and that we sort of suspend, we like change our, actually like I did think the monster was coming at me and that's why I like reacted or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't think that that's very plausible. Um, okay, so I hope that was like helpful. I'm interested in in your your thoughts, where you think it's useful, where you think it's terrible, and yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm.